By pairing a monster movie with a war epic, The Thirteenth Warrior actually puts a new spin on the fish-out-of-water archetype. Canada be damned, I'm going to the Klondike. The Klondike is Canada. Giorgio, you be doing just fine, brother. Over 20 years ago, you'd have a hard time trying to find a movie with Vikings in it. Unlike today, they weren't as common back then. On the cusp of the millennium, The Thirteenth Warrior was one of those rare films that showcased these barbarians. Not only did we get a taste of Viking life, but we got it through the eyes of an Arab. To put this in context, The Thirteenth Warrior follows the story of Ahmed ibn Fadlan, played by Antonio Banderas who is banished from his homeland of what is today modern-day Iraq. Traveling west, he encounters a group of Vikings, whose fortune teller pushes him to join their quest, to rid a distant village of ancient creatures. If this sounds like a fish-out-of-water type of story, you'd be right. Although the movie doesn't lean into the Middle Eastern side of things that much, it still manages to occasionally remind us that Ahmed is an outsider to these brutes. Having no knowledge whatsoever of their way of life, he's constantly trying to play catch-up. This works both as a way of seeing through his eyes, as well as a clever way of spouting off exposition. As much as I personally love exposition, I completely understand why many people don't. Often it's a big cumbersome dump of information that's unloaded in one scene that sticks out like a sore thumb. However, in The Thirteenth Warrior, it's a much different beast. By having Ahmed as the rookie of this group, it gives the storytellers license to routinely give us exposition. Fortunately for us, the writing and performances are so casual, it doesn't stick out so obviously. This kind of clever methodology can be witnessed in several aspects of the Thirteenth Warrior. Perhaps the best example is one such sequence where Ahmed learns to speak the local language. Hmm. Better? For no did you learn our language? Neither before nor since have I seen this technique used. It's an absolutely brilliant way of transitioning between languages. Yet not only does it do that, but it also sets the stage and emphasizes his outsider status in the first act. Then, by the lead into the second act, Ahmed's learned the language, accepted as one of the Vikings, and we're off to the races. Being somewhat of a war film, the Thirteenth Warrior doesn't break much new ground in terms of shooting battle scenes from its 90s counterpart. Shot by both John McTiernan and Michael Crichton, it's difficult to say where one ends and the other picks up. Their styles are in keeping with the style of the time. Although dated, its appearance is engaging, though not necessarily an identifiable trademark of either director. One of the curious things about the Thirteenth Warrior is the cast. Very often it's the case in war movies, slasher films, or any other such movies with several deaths, the majority of the ensemble dies. We're not given much backstory or character development, because it's understood that these characters won't be around for long. What we do get are simple characteristics, or trademarks that help us identify them beyond their name. This most certainly is the case with the 13th Warrior. Their character names are almost never used, and even after 20 plus years and having seen this over a dozen times, I can't even name half of them. However, that isn't a criticism of their performances. In fact, 
Many of them bring something unique and individualistic, which makes them both easy to pick out and enjoyable to watch. Of the casts we do get to enjoy for the longer haul, three in particular stand out. The first being our main hero, Antonio Banderas. Banderas is a surprisingly great choice for this character, because he's playing against his usual type. Most of the time he's cast as someone more confident and capable. Yet in the 13th Warrior, he's playing the opposite. Like I said before, being the fish out of water, he's continually learning the ropes with hesitation and self-doubt. The moments where his character can stand out and offer his contribution is with his brains, not his muscles. Bear skulls. I don't think they like company. The claws. The headdresses. Bears. They think they are bears. They want us to think they are bears. Hey! The next plant. Many fires. Is there a cave? It is in these moments Banderas hits the mark and proves his versatility as an actor. The closest character to Banderas' Ahmed is that of Herger, the Joyce, played by Dennis Storhoy. Initially introduced to us as the translator between Ahmed and the other Vikings, he's often used as a means of explaining how this foreign world works. Once Ahmed learns the language, Herger is still a go-between, in a sense. He's as much of a teacher to us as he is a med, by way of exposition. However, Herger's value isn't merely that of an informer. Being the sole outsider of the group, Ahmed not only finds a teacher in Herger, but also an older brother figure. Herger even refers to him as such. Put your hand down, little brother. Let's go, little brother. We have defenses to build. Joy Heights. He is perhaps the only Viking accepting of this Middle Eastern ambassador, and yet, you get the sense that this is not simply because he is the only one who can translate, it's because he genuinely likes Ahmed. Storhoy sells this beautifully, along with the title of being the joyous one. The final cast member worth highlighting is that of Vladimir Kulich, who plays the leader of the Vikings Bolvai. Although the leader, Kulich plays second fiddle to Banderas and Storhoy. Even with smaller screen time, Kulich milks every moment for what it's worth. My lord, this is Bulvai, son of Gilead, come from across I the sea. The man. I sent for him. No matter, boy, he knew his father, and I know him now. Grown to a man. Grown to fine, fine man. What troubles this place, old man? <sighs> his very presence alone is enough to explain why he's the leader. Indeed, he shows strength, yet there's also a quiet confidence in the character of Bulva. His calm nature feels the opposite of what you would imagine a Viking to be. Less brutish and more stoic, Coolidge presents Bulva in a way that's more of a mystery. Quite often, this is how we see Bulvai, lurking in the corner, silently witnessing or observing from a distance. In the moments he has dialogue, his words are brief yet impactful. I suppose it's not that difficult to understand why the 13th Warrior didn't do so well at the box office. My theory has nothing to do with the merits of the film itself, but the difficulty in pigeonholing it. Unlike war epics like Braveheart or Gladiator, the Thirteenth Warrior is an amalgamation of things. It is not just a Viking tale, but a fish-out-of-water story, with mystical creatures and an Arabian twist. Indeed, this is a grand departure from the days of simple sword and sandal adventures. The shame of all of this is how forgotten to time the Thirteenth Warrior has become. Although, I'll admit, there has been better films before and after this, which are in the same vein, None I can think of take big swings like the 13th Warrior. Given those audacious choices, 20 plus years later, those choices still stand the test of time. So, if you have the time, I'd highly recommend watching the 13th Warrior, if for any reason, simply to witness something that's both fun and unique. 
and with so many films being similar, why not take a chance on something different?